Hello and welcome to this introduction to microbiology video. I'm Dr. Alad Roberts and in this video we're going to look at some of the history associated with bacteriology and some of the key influential figures that have helped to shape our understanding of bacteria. And so I guess one of the first questions we must ask ourselves is what is bacteriology? Well, in simple terms, it is the branch of microbiology that specifically encompasses a wide range of topics, including the characteristics, behaviours and interactions of bacterial cells with their environment. Now, our understanding of bacteria in disease processes and environmental applications has taken hundreds of years to develop, with much of our understanding coming in the last hundred years or so but it was the initial discoveries that were pivotal in propelling this field forward and so we're going to go on a bit of a journey and look at how our understanding of bacteria has come to pass. And it all started towards the end of the 17th century when Robert Hooke, a physicist and an inventor, built the very first compound microscope and in doing so he was able to view thin slices of cork. Now whilst looking at this cork under the microscope, he observed tiny pore-like structures which he called cells, and this was the first time the term cell was used in a biological context. Hooke then went on to make observations of various biological specimens and in 1665 he published Micrographia, a manuscript that detailed the structure of mould which he observed as a form of plant life, noting its intricate filaments and spores, and overall he laid the foundations for the field of microbiology, opening up the microscopic world. Now shortly after Robert Hooke came Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who is often considered the father of microbiology, and this is because he was the first to document single-celled microorganisms, and he was able to do this because he developed an upgraded microscope, complete with magnifying lenses, a sample holder, and a way of adjusting the sample focus. And so in 1677 he published the famous Letter on the Protozoa, where he described what he referred to as animacules, or small animals moving around under the microscope's lens. Today we know these observations to be the very first detailed description of protists and bacteria living in a range of environments. Now despite being the father of microbiology, his discovery didn't make much of an impact, However, two centuries later there would be a resurgence in microbiology research, as the baton of scientific discovery was passed on to Louis Pasteur, who was looking at where microorganisms come from and the theory of spontaneous generation. Now this was the widely held belief that living organisms could spontaneously generate from non-living matter, so as an example it was believed rotting meat was able to spontaneously produce maggots as it decomposed. Now Pasteur was not content with this theory due to the work of two other scientists. First was the work of Francesco Redi, who in the 1660s showed that fully sealed jars containing meat would decompose but remain maggot free, whereas jars that were left open would decompose and maggots would be observed, which we now know is the result of flies having access to the meat where they would lay their eggs. More recently he looked at the work of Lazzaro Spallanzani, who in the 1760s showed that boiled meat broth in sealed flasks showed no signs of microbial life until the flask was opened, indicating that microorganisms came from outside sources and did not spontaneously generate from the broth itself. Now both these scientists laid the foundations for Pasteur's work, and in 1861 he was able to disprove the theory of spontaneous generation through the use of a swan neck flask that he had invented. And if we look at his experiments, he started by placing a nutrient rich broth in a swan neck flask. Now unsurprisingly this would very quickly spoil as microorganisms started to grow in the broth. He then took a second flask added meat broth and then rapidly boiled and cooled the liquid, killing anything that might be in the flask. He then left the flask untouched for a year and it remained free of microorganisms despite not being sealed. This showed that microorganisms did not spontaneously generate from nutrient rich broth. Now to further test his hypothesis he noted that within the u-bend of the swan neck flask some material had accumulated. This material did not have direct access to the broth, 
However, he tipped the flask sideways so that this material fell into the broth, and very quickly after doing this, microorganisms started to grow, proving that microorganisms came from an external source and disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. And so essentially he had shown that microorganisms had come from other microorganisms. Now at this point in time, he turned his attention away from fermentation and meat broth spoilage and started to focus on infectious diseases. And by applying what he had learnt, he was able to develop and become the founder of what we now refer to as germ theory, which is where specific diseases are caused by specific microorganisms, and this would be picked up by another scientist later on. Before then though, and around the same time as Louis Pasteur, John Snow, an English physician, was looking at the transmission of microorganisms, specifically during an outbreak of cholera in London in 1854. At the time, germ theory was in its infancy, and the prevailing theory was miasma, which is the belief that diseases were spread by bad air. Now Snow was sceptical of this theory, and so began an investigation mapping cholera cases across London. Now this was a pioneering study because he documented everything, interviewing residents and using infection data to track and understand the spread of disease. And essentially his results led to a critical discovery, an increased cluster of cholera cases around a public water pump on Broad Street. Now in a bold move, Snow convinced local authorities to remove the handle of the water pump, and the result was a marked decrease in new cholera cases, providing compelling evidence that the disease was waterborne and earning him the title of the father of modern epidemiology. Now the work of John Snow did many things, the most fundamental from a scientific point of view being that he emphasised the need for empirical evidence when trying to understand infectious diseases, which brings us nicely onto the remarkable contribution of Robert Koch a German physician who two decades later provide the definitive proof of the specific agents causing these diseases. And this was based on two publications, the first in 1882 titled The Etiology of Tuberculosis, where his research into tuberculosis led to him isolating and growing the tubercule bacillus, which essentially meant that he had successfully identified the causative agent of tuberculosis. He then built upon this scientific process for his second paper, developing a set of criteria now known as Cox postulates, which is a systematic way to link specific microorganisms to a specific disease, and these postulates became the gold standard for microbial research. Essentially, the first postulate demanded that the specific microorganisms be found in all cases of the diseased, but not in healthy cases. The second was that the microorganism had to be isolated from the disease and grown in pure culture. The third was that the pure culture had to then cause the same disease when introduced back into a healthy host organism. And finally, the fourth postulate was that the microorganism had to be re-isolated from the newly diseased, and this had to be the same as the one that had been isolated in the original infection. Together, these postulates and rigorous research transformed microbiology. Now up to this point, everything was falling into place. We had it pretty figured out in terms of human infections and the cause of diseases. However, the biggest part of the puzzle was still missing. How do we deal with these disease-causing microorganisms for the betterment of human health? And this is where the work of Paul Ehrlich in the early 1900s comes in. He was a microbiologist with a keen interest in immunology and chemotherapy, trying to identify ways in which we could inhibit bacterial infections. Now his work was built on the foundational principles established by two prominent physicians. The first was Ignaz Semmelweis, a Hungarian physician who in the 1840s introduced chlorine handwashing in obstetrical clinics to prevent puerperal fever a practice that drastically reduced mortality rates. His insistence on the importance of cleanliness laid the groundwork for antiseptic methods championed by Joseph Lister in the 1860s. 
Lister was a surgeon who started to use carbolic acid, more commonly known nowadays as phenol, and he used it as a disinfectant during surgeries, which turned out to greatly reduce post-operative infection rates, and this led to the practice of antiseptic surgery. Now, Ehrlich built upon these earlier advances, hypothesizing about a magic bullet, and this was the idea that a compound could specifically target disease-causing microorganisms without harming the human body. And from this hypothesis, he developed Salvasan to treat syphilis, a rampant sexually transmitted bacterial infection at the time. Now, Salvasan was an arsenic derivative, which had been highly modified to be less toxic to humans, but it still retained its effectiveness against the syphilis bacterium, allowing us to use it with fewer side effects. Now, this development was crucial for the evolution of chemotherapy and the treatment of infectious diseases. However, it wasn't until 1928 when one of the world's most famous microbiologists, Alexander Fleming, pushed this theory forward. He is credited with the identification of the very first antibiotic, a compound that specifically targets and inhibits microorganisms with extremely low toxicity towards humans. And his first antibiotic that he discovered was penicillin. Now the story of how this happened is somewhat of an accident. You see, Fleming had been working hard looking at growing bacterial cells in petri dishes. However, he decided rather abruptly to go on holiday, and he left his experiments running. Upon returning to the lab, he noticed something unusual. Some mould, later identified as Penicillium notatum, had contaminated the Petri dish and started to grow. Now, the most striking bit about this was that around the mould, there was a clearing where no bacterial cells had grown. This zone of inhibition, where the bacteria were unable to grow, piqued Fleming's curiosity, and he hypothesised that the mould was releasing a substance that stopped the bacteria from growing. And so a year later, after much research, it was found that the substance being produced, which we now know as penicillin, was antibacterial, and more importantly, it could inhibit a wide range of bacterial cells. Now, unfortunately, the broader scientific community initially overlooked the significance of Fleming's work, and it wasn't until the 1940s when penicillin was purified and mass-produced for the treatment of bacterial infections, holding in the golden age of antibiotics. And so to round out this history, we need to fast forward to the 1960s. With the introduction of antibiotics, the field of medicine was riding a wave of optimism, and William H. Stewart, who was the US Surgeon General at the time, made a famous, or now infamous statement, saying, it is time to close the book on infectious disease, declare the war on pestilence won, and shift national resources to such chronic conditions as cancer and heart disease. Now, history has proven this to be a very premature statement due to the emergence of AMR, or antimicrobial resistance. This is where the very drugs that we hailed as miracle cures are now losing their effectiveness as microorganisms adapt to them, a process that takes time but is exacerbated by the overuse and misuse of different antibiotics. Now, when this statement was made, AMR wasn't new. In fact, just a few short years after the introduction of penicillin, resistance in microorganisms was being observed, and therefore his statement serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of complacency in public health, and that we need to be continually innovative in our fight against infectious diseases. And with that, we come to the end of this video. Hopefully you found the content useful, informative, and most importantly, easy to understand. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.